1 Kings 12. And this is where we were last uh, last Wednesday night, so I want to pitch up that thought. 1 Kings 12, we've been talking about, you know, things that affect the home and raising children. And, and, um, and yet a lot of the principles really affect all sorts of things. It, it affects just, you know, the way you live in Christian life. And um, you know, one of the things we, we mentioned last week was, um, and this is sort of where we started off with that, that, um, you know, when you start trying to teach your children to obey, and, and of course, you know, we're thinking, you know, you, we've got a lot of young parents with young, young children. And when you really start um, really getting really serious about disciplining them and um, uh, doing all that sort of stuff. Didn't look right. Um, you know, somebody will, somebody will speak up and they'll say, oh, you know, well, you know, if you're if you're if you're strict, if you really expect uh real tight obedience, you know, if you're really hard on that, uh, it'll cause rebellion. And uh, they say that because, you know, they, they know somebody, they know some friend of theirs that they thought that was the case. And um, they said, yeah, you know, you can, you can do all that stuff, but when your kids get older, they're going to go crazy. And, um, and people believe this because they've heard it, they've experienced it, they think they've seen it. Um, but it is a wrong conclusion. You know, what you really believe affects how you live. And a lot of people are really in a, in a bad place or they're in a really goofy place. And it's not because they're bad people, but it's because they have believed something that really is not true at all. But it seems right to them or somebody they, somebody they heard, you know, somebody they trusted or, thought, you know, somebody in their family uh, taught them something. And it really, really messes them up. And so that's the same with this thought of um, being strict causing rebellion. And we talked a lot about that uh, last Wednesday night. So I want to finish that thought. And so we're in 1 Kings 12, and I want to read it together. Again, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt that they sent and called him and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam saying, thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake in him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. In other words, you haven't seen anything yet. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, 
My father made our yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed into their tents. At that moment, the kingdom of Israel split. Um, Rehoboam had the opportunity to rule over the whole kingdom. But the people came to him and they said, you know, your dad, you know, he really, uh, he was, he really was a hard taskmaster. He, he taxed us heavily. He made our life very difficult. And he said, uh, if you'll just, um, if you'll lighten up, we, we will serve thee. And so he consults with those uh, those old men, and they said, they said to him, if you'll tell the people, and if you'll do this, if you'll speak good words to them and be their servants, they will be thy servants. For He said, they'll so appreciate that. If you'll lighten their load, if you'll seem their servant instead of being on a power trip, if you'll be a blessing to this people, you'll have no trouble with them the rest of your days. And then Rehoboam consulted with the young guys and, um, um, you know, it, it really seems crazy, but they just said, man, they said, you're the king, you're the big dog. And of course they're thinking they're going to get a piece of the action. You know, they're, they're, they're consulting with the king already. They're just, they're just going to, you know, pad their paychecks and, and they're just going to, uh, they're not worried about a revolt. They figure we're, we're, you know, you're, you're the king and we're with you and, and you just tell them how it's going to be. And so he says, yeah, I think I will. And man, when he did that, the 12 tribes split and 10 left with Jeroboam. And so all that was left to Rehoboam was two. And from that day forward, Israel was never a united kingdom. Um, and the problem was that um, Rehoboam, embraced a very wrong idea of what it meant to be the leader. So, you know, in every home, you got the dad, he's the leader. And then you got the mom, you know, when, when dad's at work, you know, and, and uh, boy, I tell you what, those kids are with mom 80% of the time, you know, she's the leader. And, um, and then, you know, we got a bunch of you in here then one way or another, um, you're going to be in a workplace. You know, in this day and age, it doesn't take much to distinguish yourself in the workplace. You know, it used to, it was really a, a tough competition, you know, to see who was going to, who was going to really move up through the company and who was going to get the better job and who was going to get the, the best bid on this or that or the other. But in this day and age that we live in, if you'll show up for work on time and if you'll work hard and do a good job, that's all you got to do. And you're quickly going to get noticed. Uh, when we lived in Saskatchewan, my neighbor worked for the Department of Highways. He was about 30 or 35. And uh, he had a good job. And uh, we were talking one day and he said, yeah, he said, it's gotten to the place uh, there in Saskatchewan where in that that branch where they worked. He said, and he said, I'm joking, but he said, but I'm really not. He said, if you can walk a straight line and sign your name, they'll hire you. He said, they are desperate. I never, uh, I never, I never saw this growing up, you know, and it, 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 it was a recent phenomena. But I remember, you know, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, we would be pulling through somewhere and uh, Yorkton was the halfway point. If we were on our way to Portage to Prairie, Manitoba for some of the youth meetings or the or the uh, camp meetings there, we would leave. And Yorkton was the four hour mark. It was the halfway point, And that's where all the restaurants were and all that stuff, you know. So we'd stop there. And and uh, first time I ever saw it, you know, um, uh, the restaurant, you know, closed you know, on Mondays and close during certain hours because we can't find good help. And then I started noticing in these fast food places, you had 60 year old ladies working in these fast. I'm going, what is this? What is this? And, uh, you know, it's because uh, the young people, they didn't want to work those jobs. And then even if they did, they weren't reliable. 
They just had no work ethic whatsoever. No sense of responsibility. No sense of they had to be on time. Uh, you know, they would call out sick and they just wouldn't show up for work and on and on and on. You know, um, it, it, it doesn't take much if you'll just work hard and do a good job at what you do. You're going to get noticed. And, and there's many of you that the day will come when you're going to um, you're going to be put in a place, a position of leadership. Don't you just hate it? You know, you'll, you're somewhere and, and, and you're in a place and uh, somebody is on a power trip. You know, doesn't that just just gall you when you're, you know, and um, and that's because they have a wrong. They have the Rehoboam syndrome. Oh, man, I'm the big dog. I can make your life miserable. Um, if you do that in your home. If you do that with your wife. If you do that to your kids. Um you're going to have a mess on your hands that you cannot fix down the road. And you will stir up a pot of rebellion. They will hate you. They will hate your God. They'll hate Christianity. And uh, it'll, it'll be a miracle of God that they ever come back. Um, years ago, we were at our house and uh, we had this guy that started coming to our church in Saskatchewan. He was about 40. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say some really politically incorrect things right here. And I don't, I'm just trying to tell the story, okay? He was, he was an Oriental. He was from China. And, um, and, and, and a lot of those Orientals, they really look young for their age. That's just, they're blessed. That's just the way they are. And um, he was 40, but he looked, he, he looked, he looked like he was 30. Um, and he, um, he started visiting our church. I'll never forget the first phone call I got. This is, do you guys, um, do you guys believe the King James Bible? I said, yes. He said, you guys believe certain things? I said, yes. And man, he was excited. And I was excited because I was young. I had pastored real long. This was one of those phone calls. I thought, wow, praise the Lord. This guy's going to show up in our church. And, and he did. And he turned out to be a royal pain in the neck on many fronts. Um, and uh, he, he didn't last real long. But one, it was summertime and he's at our house. Elizabeth was about 18 or 19 and um, it was hot and we're me and this guy are sitting at the table and we're just having conversation. He was from China. You know, he was telling me his story and his story was interesting, interesting story. And I asked Elizabeth, I said, Elizabeth, would you, would you mind me getting, uh, would you mind getting me a glass of tea? And I think I, I looked at him and I'm trying to be real careful not to say his name. Um, I said, would you like a, a glass of tea? And he said, sure. So she walks away to get the tea. And then he says to me, I need to get married and have some kids so that they can do that for me. And, um, the, the, and, and he was on a mission. Oh, he was on a mission to get married. And um, he saw a wife and children as his servants. He saw the purpose of a wife and children is instant servants. And he really felt that way. Someone to wait on him hand and foot. And uh, yeah, you know, in a home, you know, you're working together and you're hopefully you're serving each other, you know. But, you know, that kind of an attitude is just destroys relationships. Look at verse seven again, first Kings 12 verse seven. And they spake unto him saying, the old men said, if thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day and will serve them and answer them. Uh, you know, what comes to my mind is, is I, I surely nobody in here gives your spouse the silent treatment. Surely not. Not in this church. <clears throat> you know, that's a favorite tactic of some people, you know. You know, um, you know, you know, uh, the old man said, don't do that to these people. You want to be a good leader? Do you want your you want your family to love you? 
Don't do that to them. And we'll answer them and speak good words to them. You know, one of the things that stirs up uh, rebellion is there's no sweetness. There's no sweetness. You know, and you know, you, you know how it is before you get married, you know, um, you know, most of the time, most of the time, one of the drawing cards is, oh, he's so sweet. And, you know, and, and she's so sweet. And, you know, everything is just smiles and laughter. And and um, and I just want to say a word here. Um, uh, you need to uh, you need to be careful with that. OK. And you need to be genuine. And boy, that's hard to do, isn't it? Uh, but but could we say it this way? Not that it's false, but the same work you put into it then should be everlasting. You know, if some people still treated their husband like they did before they married them, wow, it'd be wonderful. If some people still treated their wife like they did before they married them, it would be wonderful. I heard a guy say this, and it's a very true statement. He said, women often marry a man thinking, oh, he'll change. That's a mistake. And men, now get, get this, listen to this. Women marry a man thinking, oh, there's a few things that drive me crazy, but, but he'll change. And men marry this woman and they think, I hope she never changes. Do you see the dilemma? Everything's so sweet. And as a leader, you want to keep it that way. You want to keep it there. Speak good words to them. You know, in some homes, you know, dad, dad's at the helm. And, I, and, and it, it, it can be this thing of, of there's no fun and no approval and no praise. And you know what? You know, the only thing that you, you, you got to watch this thing where mom, dad, uh, the only thing you notice is what they forgot to do. You know, you know, one of your kids, you know, they, they'll do a job for you and they, they really hustled around and, you know, maybe they, they, they cleaned up their room and they come, mommy, look at my room. And, and you know what? They did it like a kid does it. You know, a kid doesn't have the eagle eye that you have. And, and if you're not careful, you'll, you'll, you'll sharply. Well, I, I doesn't look clean to me. You just knock the wind out of a little child that loved you. You're not going to get away with that real often. It's going to bite you. Speak good words to them. There should be sweetness. There should be laughter. One guy said this, you know, a guy that was really uh, good on child rearing. He wrote some books on it. He said, he said, um, you, you've got to discipline your children and you, you've got to make them toe the line. But he said, you better make sure, though, that they don't live under a cloud of wrath. He said, when they need corrected, jump on it, get her done, do it right, get her done. But he said, but once you've done that, then let the sun shine and let them live in the sunshine of your joy that you love them and you enjoy them. And they will be thy servants forever. Speak good words to them. Serve them. Giving to them. You know, sacrificing to bless them. Um, you know, every, I think every parent, I think I can say safely, most of our kind of parents, you do, um, you do make sacrifices for your children, I hope. And you know, as when they're little, they don't notice all that. But when they get a little older, they do notice the things that you do for them. And um, um, make sure you're doing that. Make sure they make sure they see that you're you're willing to deny yourself for mom. You know, uh, it's like the guy that. 
there was a guy that rolled into a church and and they had a wife and you know six or seven kids and uh he's driving a band, brand new pickup truck and he gets out of the out of the truck and he's in a brand new suit and his wife and all the kids they looked a little on the ratty side you knew who was taking care of who there you know it ought to be just the opposite you know and um um and that will bless your family. You, you, some of you, you're going to have kids. And these these days, for some of you, are not far away. And and look, look, I said it. It's first, I'm going to say it again. You know, I'm not saying this to make anybody feel like a failure. And, and I don't, oh boy, I'm hoping, I'm hoping. We don't have any of these tense conversations on the way home. I had a guy that, he ultimately left my church in Saskatchewan. We were talking some about some of this stuff. And uh, man, we, we, one night, they went home from church. The wife really liked the message. He did not. And that was the beginning of the end. That is not my goal here. My goal is wherever you're at with this thing, man, just, you know, and, and don't go home and say, you know, honey, you need to work on that. No, no, no. You know, zone in on the person in the mirror. Leave him alone. You you leave her alone. And you just, you just think, by God's grace, I want to do what I need to do. It's amazing. Some people, all they can ever see is the other person. And, and you don't want to do that. Again, verse 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day. Man, that, that takes some humility. You know, but there was no humility because in verse 14, he says, yeah, he says, he says, you know what? He said, I'm going to, my dad chastised you with whips, but he said, I'm going to do scorpions. He said, he said, you thought my dad was bad? He said, man, you wait till I'm in the driver's seat. There was arrogance. Um, you know, to, to serve somebody, you know, you're, you're going to need to lower yourself a little bit. Um, Rehoboam was not going to lower himself. He was the big dog. He was not going to submit to their needs. He was not going to pay any attention to their sincere request. Verse 13 is really interesting. Look at the wording. And the king answered the people roughly. He was sharp-tongued and nasty and ugly and rude. And you don't always have to raise your voice to do that. Some people are loud and nasty, but some people are just, they just have this knack for just, you know, they just say something. Um, and he would run over them like a steamroller when he needed to. Proverbs 29, 23 says, a man's pride will bring him low. A man or a woman's pride will destroy their marriage and it will destroy their relationship with their children because they will never admit their blunders. They will never apologize for their wrong. I'm talking about a sincere apology. You know, some people's apologies are pretty, pretty bad. You know, well, I'm, I'm sorry I made you act like an idiot. Uh, well, I, if, you know, you know, if, if, if I, I don't know what I did, but you know, oh no, you just, you just screamed and pressed every button and everything else. Oh, you know, if, if, if I, if I made you upset, I'm sorry. Pray tell what kind of an apology is that? An apology is I blew it. I'm wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. It's my fault. And I am sorry. And, and you don't stand there waiting and say, okay, now you say your part. <laughs> no. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt, exalt you. Boy, I tell you what, man, when you're willing to go down, God's going to bring you up. The reason some people can't go up is because they won't go down. And I tell you, it's a wonderful thing, you know, when you can, when you can humble yourself. And just admit, it's a wonderful thing. You know, um, we're talking about st strictness causing rebellion versus what really causes rebellion. To be strict in itself, to expect to, to toe the line, to expect immediate obedience, to really work on that 
is uh, that's that's not what causes rebellion. So I, I close with this. Can I give you some examples of that? Because some of you are probably thinking, wow, but I, I know somebody and they were really strict. Yeah, but did they do these other things? Were they willing to humble themselves? Did they love their family? Did, were they sweet? Did you know that you can be, you can toe the line and still be sweet and still be loving? You know, um, strictness does not cause rebellion. And I want to give you a couple, a couple examples of that. Did you know some of the strictest groups in the world are the most coveted to belong to? Let me give you an example. One is um, uh, any of the any of the elite military schools. There's several. Um, Annapolis, uh, West Point. Uh, there's several of those. Um, and it is it is one of the highest honors to get into those places. And but when you get in those places, it's it's not even remotely like U of A, not even remotely like they tell you when to get up. They tell you what you're going to wear and you go in uniform. If you cheat once, you're out forever. But people will go to great lengths. Some of the elite fighting groups, uh, the, the J, JTF2 here in Canada, uh, the Navy SEALs, uh, those groups. Uh, do you think those are loose run groups where everybody's a whiner? Uh, I have a friend that's uh, that joined the military, and he said nowadays it's gotten to the place where in just just a, the regular military, where if the if somebody says something that hurts your feelings, you can you can voice your complaint. Oh my soul! Oh, I'm glad. I, I really feel comfortable with them going to war. But you get those elite fighting groups, the JTF2, the Navy SEALs. Um, uh, their training is absolutely murderously brutal. Like you, you don't even have a clue. Uh, some of those guys, they they get them out on the beach, and uh, every infraction, every imagined infraction, it's push-ups and push-ups and push-ups, and then they they'll get them, and they're in full uniform. They'll get them to roll in this, go out in the water, and then roll in the sand, and then start jogging for miles, and then they have to get in the water and roll. The sea. Have you ever run with sand in your shoes and on your clothes? And they said you're running and you're getting raw and you're bleeding. And he said, your instructors could care less. He said, it's more and more and more and more. He said, uh, you know, in those, in those early days of, the, of those extreme fighting groups, he said, when they train them, he said, they're training them so that they absolutely don't care about anything. They become oblivious to pain. They are just unbelievable. He said, um, you, you're running on very little sleep. He said one, one thing he saw in his training, and he said, of course, guys are falling like flies. He said, you know, for the first several weeks of that training, he said, uh, all you got to do is just ring a bell and you're out. And he said, you, why would anybody even volunteer? Because they want to be a part of that. You know why they want to be a part of it? Because when you come out the other side, you're one of those guys. You know what? Nobody's, nobody's chanting rebellious phrases. Nobody's going, this isn't fair. You know why? They knew when they signed up. It was one of the strictest groups in the world. Strictness doesn't cause rebellion. You need to get that out of your head. Some of the most elite places on our planet. Years ago, in, in my mother-in-law's church, uh, there was a guy that worked for the CIA. And he worked for the CA for many years. He was getting near retirement. And um, my daughter, Elizabeth, there again, she was around 20 years old. And she started asking him some questions. And, you know, the CIA, that's, you know, um, that's the Central Intelligence Agency. You know, they're the, they're the group that's spying on everybody and their brother and all this stuff. And, um, and uh, so she started asking him some questions. And um, he would answer them to a point. He was elusive, but he enjoyed the fact that she was curious. And uh, finally, he said, would you like to join the CIA? She said, it sure would be neat. And he said, OK. He said, let me tell you right up front. He said, you're a woman. He said, you're only allowed one piercing on your ear, only one. If you have two, you're instantly disqualified. And he began to lay out the qualifications. 
rigid. You can, you can't, you must never, no, no, tat no tattoos, none. Oh, and yet, what an amazing place to be a part of. You see, strictness doesn't cause rebellion. It's other things that cause that. So I close with this. Um, um, years ago, um, we were we were about to move to Saskatchewan. So the, I don't know what year that would have been. It been in 1998. And um, so we're getting ready to go to Saskatchewan to take the church there in Prince Albert. We were there 11 years. So at that time, we were in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Pastor Carlson was our pastor. We were part of that church. And um, I had come from another church, and I had been there for about a year, just sort of getting my bearings. Well, an evangelist came through who was a friend of my former pastor and, and a friend of ours. And I'd never really spent much time with him. But he was one of those guys. He was like 20 years older than me. And, and of course, at that time... Um, I was about 35. And so I, I really revered this guy. He was intimidating. He was, he was very, a very hard preacher and um, a, a real nice guy, but not an ounce of foolishness. He would remind you of a military drill instructor. And I, I really liked him, but I always felt intimidated around him. And uh, so pastor Carlson's having him in to preach this meeting. So, um, Pastor Carlson says to me after one of the services, he said, do you want to come over to the house tonight and visit with uh, Brother Hasbrook? I said, I would love to. He said, well, come on over after church. I said, okay. So it was Mitzi and I and my brood. And um, Elizabeth, at, Elizabeth at that time was um, about 12 or 13. And everybody else was stair steps down to Micah. Micah was about two. And uh, so we had a bunch of little kids. And um, so, again, remember that in the years previous to this, my former pastor had really drilled into us. His strong point was the family, and he really drilled into us the same stuff I'm sharing with you, only he hammered it. I mean, about every, about every sixth or seventh message, he skinned us alive. And you guys, you guys think I'm, I am not exaggerating. There was a bunch of young families and he expected us all to have our kids under control. I think some of you guys, some of you guys, every once in a while I get a funny look from somebody and you're thinking, oh, pastor, you're just, you're just a little over the top. You have no clue. You, are, oh, I'm a teddy bear compared to him. <laughs> and, and so, you know, by the time we hit this stage of our life, Elizabeth's 12, Mike is two and everybody in between. And um, man, they were no family's perfect. No kids are perfect, but they really listened, which is, again, that's the goal of what we're talking about. We're talking about having a peaceful, happy, contented home. It's very possible, very attainable. It just takes some work. So we're about to roll into Pastor Carlson's. I look at my brood in the van and I said, all right, guys. I said, uh, you know, at that time, Pastor Carlson, uh, he might have had one child and it was tiny. And I said, uh, I don't I don't know if they got toys or not. I said, so here's the deal. You're going to sit in the living room. You're going to sit on the floor. All of you just sort, of, just sort of fan out there. We'll show you where to sit. Just sit there quietly. Don't make a sound. And, um, you know, just sort of entertain each other very quietly. I got a question. Can you tell your kids to do that? So we went in the door. My kids immediately sat down. See, some of you, th some of you are thinking, oh, the no, 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 no. It's not this bunch of kids are like, oh, daddy's going to kill us. No, it wasn't like that. Our kids were normal and happy. So they go in there. They just all sit down. And uh, we're, we're sitting there visiting and talking. And after a few minutes, Brother Hasbrook, he was very astute, very sharp. He goes, all of a sudden he stops and he smiles real big and he looks at the kids. He goes, did your daddy threaten you before you came in here? <laughs> Everybody roared with laughter. We had a great evening. 
And then I can't remember what happened. I think after that, the kids went downstairs and played with some toys because I didn't know if they had toys. You know, you you can't expect this perfect environment. But do you know what? Um, there was no. It was happy. It was peaceful. It was good. You know, um, strictness doesn't cause rebellion. If you will love them, if you will serve, if you will serve them, if you'll speak good words to them. And by the way, can I tell you that never stops? People have this idea, and it's, this is another thought. Then we're going to we're going to stop right here. People have this idea that oh well, you know, you know, J Johnny and Susie, you know, they're they're fifteen and thirteen, so you know what? I can just I can just they can fend for themselves. No, they need you. That's why God gave them to you and you to them. I know they, they become more independent, you know, hopefully they can feed themselves and dress themselves and, you know, all that good stuff. But, you know, they still need you. They still need your love. They still need your friendship. They still need your involvement. And more than ever, they need your conversation. They need your guidance. And you need to have those heartstrings tied. And those heartstrings are what really sway the balance when that day comes where they're old enough to make their own decisions. And how do those heartstrings get tied? You served them. And you answered them. And you spoke good words to them. And they will be thy servants forever. And can, can you expect them to? Can you train them? You still spank them? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. But train up a child in the way he should go. And it's it's not just being a warlord on your children, and it's sure not being a softie. It's, it's, it's walking that middle path where you're expecting obedience, but you're also being that loving, kind, good leader. And God will bless that. God will bless what goes on in their hearts. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. Lord, help us. Lord, we're all a work in progress. And Lord, it seems like just, just like with a physical house, Lord, it seems like there's always something that needs fixed. Lord, you said, you said, obeying your words, if any man hear these words and do them, he is likened to a man that built a house. And Lord, spiritually, Lord, we're building that house. And Lord, it seems, it just seems like, Lord, we're always lacking somewhere. But Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, you'd help us. Help us, Lord, to love each other, to care about each other. Help us to have grace with each other, Lord, in our families, and our marriages. And uh, Lord, um, help folks, Lord, to be good leaders, Lord, to, to have that sweetness, Lord. And Lord, the day comes, the day comes when the kids are grown and gone. And, and Lord, when that day comes, thank you, Lord, we can still pray. But Lord, I pray this, you'd help us, Lord, that in the midst of, of raising children that will obey us, Lord, help us also that those heartstrings would be tied. Lord, that they'd be tied ever so tightly for thee. God, bless our efforts. And Lord, help us. Lord, you know, you when we got saved, you, you blotted out our transgressions. And Lord, I pray. I pray, Lord, that our children, Lord, where we've made mistakes, oh, Lord, Lord, in your goodness, would you blot those out, Lord? Would you deliver us from our transgressions, Lord, and help us, Lord? Lord, those, those that would make things right this day, those that would say, boy, Lord, I've really made some mistakes. Lord, would you bless them? And as they humble themselves before you, Lord, would you lift them up? God, thank you for your goodness. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, God has spoken to you. Take just a minute and talk to him.
Lord, bless your truth and bless your people in Jesus name. Amen. You're dismissed.